A good Erev Shabbos, everyone. This Shabbos, we have the portion of Korach. Korach was one of the outstanding leaders of Klal Yisrael, from the tribe of Levi, from the family of Kahas, who was chosen to be the privileged individual amongst a few others who would be worthy of carrying the Ark of the Covenant during the travels in the desert. Korach was a very prominent and outstanding person. And Korach comes, he and Dosan and Aviram, Dosan and Aviram from the tribe of Ruvain, and they challenge the authority of Moshe Rabbeinu, stating that Moshe, you chose your brother Aharon to be the Kohen Godel and his children to be the Kahanim, and we do not believe that this was divinely ordained. But rather, even if Hashem did approve, it's because you requested it, it's what you desire, and because you're beloved to Hashem, therefore Hashem will satisfy your wishes. But the privilege of serving God in the temple, this should barely be available to all of Klal Yisrael because Kulam Kedashim, we're all holy. We all stood at Sinai. This is a sacred holy congregation. Ubesechem Hashem, God dwells amongst each and every one of us. That was the challenge that Korach, Dasan, and Aviram presented to Moshe Rabbeinu in the presence of all of Klal Yisrael. Moshe, he says to the tribe of Levi and Korach, is it not enough that God has selected you to assist in the temple service and also look at the great prominence that you have? And then Moshe calls upon Dos and Baviram to speak to them, and they refuse. Are you going to blind our eyes? We refuse. You are, you are leading us with such authority as if you are the dictator of Klal Yisrael. We refuse to speak to you. Moshe says to the children of Israel that you will see that they are going to bring an incense offering, Korach, and 250 men who are with him, and Aaron. And you will see whose offering God will accept and who will be rejected. How will we see the rejection? That if the earth opens its mouth and swallows up Korach and swallows up all those with him in Dosan Ba'aviram, you will clearly see that this indeed has been the word and the will of God. And that although Aaron is my brother, there has been no nepotism whatsoever and that it was not my wish, it was not my will, it is only my desire to fulfill the will of my Creator. And indeed, that is exactly what happens. The earth opens its mouth, swallows them up, and then closes immediately. As the Ramban and Sephardo tell us, this was not an earthquake. An earthquake doesn't open and close as if it never happened. And when Korach and Dasan Aviram were descending to the depths of purgatory, you could hear their voice saying, Moshe Emes Viterose Emes, Moshe is true, and it's the Torah that he has taught us from God is true. Rabbeinu Bachia asks a question and says, why did Moshe immediately say that you will see how they will be destroyed by God, a, mir a miracle, the earth will open its mouth? Why wasn't Moshe praying for them? By the sin of the golden calf. God said to Moshe, Klai Yisrael deserves all types of consequences, and Moshe immersed himself in prayer. God accepted our repentance. When it came to the spies, again, God said that Klai Yisrael is undeserving the land of Israel. They want to go back to Egypt. They deserve to be destroyed. And Moshe interceded, and he prayed. He immersed himself in prayer his heart and his soul. And God accepted his prayer and accepted our repentance. And we wandered in the desert, but our children entered the land of Israel. How come over here by the incident of Korach, we don't find Moshe Rabbeinu praying on behalf of Korach and Dosan and Avirim and those who are with him? Why didn't Moshe say, God, spare them, help them to repentance, God said, I'm going to destroy everyone is worthy of destruction. Those who have come to witness Korach's revolution, 
that Moshe prayed and he said, Hashem, those who have sinned, they deserve the consequences. Those who didn't, they just come to watch or whatever, they should be spared. Hashem accepted that. But why didn't Moshe Dama for Kairach? Rabbeinu Bachi says, because there's a major difference in Korach's sin and that of the golden calf and the spies. Korach was challenging Moshe Rabbeinu. Korach was saying, Moshe, you're an outstanding man. There's no question you're righteous, but you're a human being. And as a human being, you're also subject to an evil inclination to the words of the Satan and to your own thoughts and desires and goals. Moshe, you also have a plan. And this is your older brother, Aaron. We doubt that without your desire and will that God would have agreed. God acquiesced to what you desire that Aaron should be chosen. We do not believe that this was truly the divine will. And we are contesting you as the ultimate prophet. And thereby we are also contesting that the Torah that you are delivering us from God is perhaps not absolute. It is not all of divine authenticity. This was the seeds of doubt that Korach was planting. Because, yes, Korach was talking about the selection of Aaron as a Kohen. But to, in order to question that, he's questioning Moshe Rabbeinu's position. The Parsha in Baha'u'llah says that God testifies and states that the prophecy of Moshe was like no one else. One of our 13 principles of our faith is that Moshe is the Av, he's the father of all prophecy, the greatest prophet who ever lived whose perception of divine was not rivaled. And Moshe himself was able to remove all of his human emotion and desire to clearly serve God. As it says, upon him, upon him, face to face, God spoke to him. God has no face. It means it was the closest relationship. In my entire household, in my entire universe, Moshe is, has been proven as being trustworthy. There are no issues, there's no question. And now Korach is questioning this. And although he might be questioning just the selection of Aaron, but once you question one thing, then you'll question the next and the next. What will result is that just as Korach questioned about Aaron's selection, that maybe this was Moshe's idea, maybe Kashris, maybe Shabbos. And before you know it, all the tenets, the fundamentals of Judaism are destroyed. The fundamental principle is, as we say in the 13 principles, the animamins, that Moshe's prophecy is absolutely true beyond the shadow of a doubt, because God's Torah that he delivered to him is the will and the word of God for every generation. And Moshe had no influence whatsoever other than to be the perfect, pure, holy conduit between God and Klal Yisrael. Therefore, if Moshe would have prayed on behalf of Korach, Hashem forgive them, that would not have removed the seeds of doubt. The seeds of doubt that Korach planted would have remained in the hearts and the minds of Klal Yisrael. And it wasn't enough just to accept the prayers and to accept an expression of repentance, there had to be something that would be so overwhelmingly powerful that it would remove any element of doubt. There had to be an incredible miracle. By the golden calf, no one was questioning God's communication and selection of Moshe. By the spies, they didn't question Moshe. Quite the contrary. They said, Moshe, by the, by the sin of the golden calf, they were shown a vision. The Satan showed them a vision. They assumed Moshe was dead. They thought Moshe's not here. We need some other leadership. We need a new conduit. By the spies, they said, Moshe, everything you say is emiss. There's no question. But it's better for us to be here and all together under your leadership. When we go into the land of Israel, your leadership will terminate. 
But we don't know how long you'll remain with us alive, you and Aaron and Miriam. They made a mistake, but they weren't questioning the fundamental principle of God's Torah coming from Sinai, from God, to Klal Yisrael, being delivered and taught by Moshe Rabbeinu. But then the question is, if Klal Yisrael needed a remarkable miracle to uproot the doubt that of the seeds of doubt in Moshe and God's Torah and God's divine communication, why was it necessary to have a miracle in which Korach, Dosan, and Aviram would be destroyed? Why couldn't God pr produce another miracle? There is no shortage of miracles. Why couldn't God cause things to happen? The sun to set in the east and rise in the west or whatever. Why did it have to be the earth opening its mouth and swallowing them up? They should be destroyed. The Sukkah David explains and says, I would like to interject that we find at the beginning of the portion of Korach, it gives us Korach's lineage, his heritage, his, his yichus. And it traces his father, his grandfather, his great-grandfather, but it doesn't mention that he comes from Yaakov. Rashi, quoting from the Talmud, says that Yaakov prayed God. He foresaw this type of transgression. Don't associate my name. What does that mean, don't associate my name? Because his great-great-grandson does a terrible thing. What, is going to shame Yaakov? What does that mean, don't associate with Is he responsible? Are we all responsible for what happens generations later? The Sukkot David explains, there was a fundamental difference in the sin of Kairach and that of the spies and the golden calf. By the golden calf, they thought Moshe was dead. They lost their leader. They became anxious and they became nervous and they became discombobulated and were filled with fear. By the spies, they were told that they were going to leave the miraculous environment of the desert with clouds of glory and mud falling from heaven and a well, a rock following them in their travels providing water and they would have to go into the land of Israel and fight battles with a regular army and they were afraid. There was an element of fear an element of fear, a mistake in one's thought process, this can be corrected. This we can see when making a mistake. We're afraid, we'll see a miracle or whatever it might be, and that might be enough to strengthen us. There's nothing to be afraid of. Moshe is here, God is with us, here is his Torah. It will remove the fear. But by Korach, we are told that Korach, what? motivated Korach to challenge Moshe. Korach was envious of the fact that he was not selected to be the leader of his family, the Levium, of his family of the Levium. And it was the element of envy. And what motivated Dosan and Aviram? Moshe called Dosan and Aviram, let's talk, refuse to talk to you. And then even after God tells Moshe they're worthy of destruction. Moshe goes to Dasan and Avira. And rather than engage in a dialogue with Moshe, they stand by their tents, cursing and blaspheming. Why was Moshe going after God said they deserve to be destroyed? Why was Moshe continuously reaching out to them? They were motivated by envy of Moshe's position and pure hatred. Some people cannot tolerate that there should be someone who's greater and be in a position of authority. And it led to a sinner, an unwarranted, gratuitous hatred that Dustin and Avim had to Moshe, that they refused to meet with him. They stood cursing and blaspheming the name of God. Here we're not dealing with a, an element of fear. Here we're not dealing with a mistake in one's thought process. Here we're dealing with character flaws. And when we're dealing with the source, the motivating source is one's character flaw, 
Sukkot David says that all the miracles in the world won't make a difference. The Egyptians saw the splitting of the sea. Mankind knows of the splitting of the sea. And yet they refuse to accept that God exists and God has given us his Torah. Oh, it must have been an earthquake. Oh, it must have been a geological phenomenon. Whatever miracle happens, they'll come up with an excuse. Because it's not a question of I'm missing an inspiration. There's something that's motivating, which is a reflection of the weakness of the character. And unless that weakness is removed and uprooted, no matter what you show a person, God could have made a miracle like he made that the dry, lifeless stick of iron is going to bloom and blossom. And they would have said, well, yeah, that's God doing it for you, Moshe. Whatever God does, he's doing it for you. You're influencing him or Aaron's influencing him. Or maybe it's this or maybe it's that. There is nothing we can say that will help them. And therefore, Moshe Rabbeinu knew that he had to uproot the seeds of doubt of the veracity of his prophecy and of God's Torah being of divine authenticity, the eternal word of the living God to guide us and direct us throughout our lives in every generation, enabling us to enter into the world to come. Moshe knew there had to be a miracle which would result, unfortunately, in the destruction of Korach, Dosen, and Aviram. And that Moshe extended himself to Korach and Dosen and Aviram because his mission was not only to intercede on behalf of Kalal Yisrael, provide the remedy, the vaccine that they needed for this transgression of doubt, but he was also trying to achieve an element of atonement for Korach, Dosen, and Aviram. What can atone for their terrible, horrible transgression? the iniquity of planting doubt amongst Klal Yisrael? The only answer is their death. A death, a destruction, in which they will be able from the depths of the earth, wherever they might be, to scream out and say, Moshe, M.S. Moshe is true. He is the true, holy, pure prophet of God. The Teirah Emes and the Torah that God has given us through Moshe is absolutely true. This is the truth. It is the only truth. And there is nothing else. The Parsha shows us there can be differences of opinion. It says in Ethics of Our Fathers, there are constant differences of opinion throughout the Talmud, Hillel and Shama. But it's not influenced by one's personality. It's not influenced by envy by greed, by pursuing honor, by gratuitous hatred. These disagreements, they are motivated by the desire to seek out the truthful word of God. But then you have the machlekes, the disagreement of Korach and his legion. This is the disagreement which is not to seek out truth. It's a reflection of the flaws in their character. We all have flaws in our character. We're fooling ourselves if we think we don't. How then can we deal and how do we proceed and try to remain immune from the element of Korach and his legion? The answer is to reflect upon what we say in our prayers and to set aside time to study Torah and Torah, and also the works, the ethical works of our sages to help us achieve an element of humility and realize that we're all in the hands of our Creator and that we're blessed with 120 years and life is short and life is fleeting and that we will answer to our Creator to know where we've come from, to know where we are going and before whom we must give an account. Keeping these things in mind will help keep us sober and keep us properly focused so that our personalities, our desires, our character flaws should not mislead us and take us down a path of destruction. There are those who question the veracity and authenticity of our Torah. 
There are those who try to say, the sages made this up, the sages made that up, the bunch of rabbis, whatever, I don't know who these rabbis are, but they came together and nothing else to do but make our lives miserable. We don't need it today. This, we must ask ourselves, is it not a repetition of Korach and his legion? The answer is to be truthfully honest with ourselves, to realize our mortality, and to know before whom we stand and before whom we shall give an account. God has blessed us with his Torah. It is the means by which we can achieve the happiness in this world and the eternity that we all desire. May Hashem help us and give us the strength to recognize our flaws, to question sometimes our decisions. What is motivating me? What is the true motivation? And if indeed I discover there's an element of envy or whatever it might be, maybe I have to reassess my position in this world. Stay healthy. Stay safe, stay Jewish, and Shabbos. <clears throat>